learning outcomes. When you hear the term FTI, what is the first thing that comes into your mind? In this unit, you will learn about foreign direct investment FTI. After going through this lesson, you shall be able to define FTI, identify different forms of FTI, analyze the rationale behind FTI for both home, I repeat, for both home and host countries, describe the pattern of FTI, horizontal and vertical, explain impact and implications of FTI in recipient countries. Introduction the belief in the growth enhancing effects of FDI has influenced economic policy making. The foreign direct investment is the act of investing a certain capital in the chosen business enterprise that operates in foreign countries. FDI is usually a physical investment like building a factory or an office. It usually includes a parent company which in the effort of expanding establishes its office as a permanent company in a foreign country. In this way, the parent company gets the level of multinational company, MNC, and its investment is known as FTI for the host country. There are a number of risks which are always there in FTI for both the host country and the MNC. Although there is substantial evidence that such investment benefits host countries, they should assess its potential impact carefully and realistically. However, FDI has been a contentious issue in international business. There are many reasons why FDI has become a much discussed topic. Foreign Direct Investment Statistics The data provided by agencies like UNCTED OECD, IMF and BEA constitute the main source for the reported data on FTI flows. The discussion in this unit is largely based on reports and publications of above agencies. Calculations of FDI and FPI are typically measured as either a flow referring to the amount of investment made in one year or as stock measuring the total accumulated investment at the end of that year. The triad, a great deal of global trade and FDI is conducted by companies in the US, Western Europe and Japan. The companies in Western Europe come from nations that are members of the EU and collectively areas of the US, EU and Japan are called triad. Multinational firms from Japan, Korea, EU and US play a key role as bringers of capital technology, markets and management as well as agents of economic integration. Over time, popular destinations of FDI shift. The most popular FDI destination in the 1970s was newly industrialized economies NIEs like Hong Kong, Singapore, Korea and Taiwan. In the late 1980s, it was ASEAN 4, especially Thailand and Malaysia. Since the 1990s to present, China and India have emerged as the popular FDI destination in the whole group of emerging economies. Next is the concept of FDI. Foreign direct investment FDI is called by various terms like direct foreign investment, direct investment or foreign investment. FDI is equity funds investment in other nations. It is an activity where Foreign firms come to the host country to set up and run an enterprise like factory, hotel, farms or other businesses. FDI intends to control and participate in the management of a business enterprise. It is undertaken by MNCs who exercise control of their foreign affiliates and involves foreign investors taking a controlling and lasting stake in productive enterprises in host countries. As such, FDI is considered an international financial flow with the intention of controlling or participating in the management of an enterprise in a foreign country. FDI is not just a transfer of ownership as it usually involves the transfer of factors complementary to capital, including management, technology and organizational skills. Such inflows are commonly associated with multinational corporations that have operations and production facilities across the world. 
Therefore, they are widely perceived as important resource for expediting the industrial development of receiving or host countries. Most developing countries therefore have a welcoming attitude towards MNCs and FTI. Salient features of FTI. The following are the important features of FTI. First, an investment made to acquire lasting interest in enterprises operating outside of the country of the investor. Second, the foreign entity that makes the investment is termed the direct investor. Third, the investor's purpose is to gain an effective voice in the management of the enterprise. Some degree of equity ownership is almost always considered to be associated with an effective voice in the management of an enterprise. The IMF Balance of Payments Manual 5th edition BPM5 suggests a threshold of 10% of equity ownership to qualify an investor as a foreign direct investor. An effective voice in management only implies that direct investors are able to influence the management of an enterprise and does not imply that they have absolute control. Fourth, in most instances, both the investor and the asset it manages abroad are business firms. In such cases, the investor is typically referred to as the parent firm and the asset as the affiliate or subsidiary. And fifth, operationally FTI flows may take the following forms. A. Equity acquisition, buying shares of an existing or a newly created enterprise. B. Profit reinvestment, FDI firms reinvesting their profits for further expansion. And C. Loans from a parent company. Like exports and imports, FDI is a driver of international business and many companies use FDI to establish footholds in the world marketplace by setting up operations in foreign markets or by acquiring business there. Difference between FDI and Foreign Portfolio Investment FPI FDI is distinguished from FPI. FPI means the purchase of one country securities by nationals of another country. Portfolio Investment FPI has no intention or interest to control an enterprise. The purpose of FPI is to get a good financial return as in the case of investing in stocks, bonds, gold, art objects, etc. However, the most important distinction between FDI and FPI is that FDI is undertaken with the intention of exercising a reasonable degree of control over an enterprise. FDI is less volatile than portfolio investment or bank loans. While FDI tends to be generally undertaken by MNCs, FPI comes from many diverse sources such as a small company's pension or through mutual funds held by individuals. The returns that an investor acquires on FPI usually take the form of interest payments or dividends. Investments in FPI that are made for less than one year are distinguished as short-term portfolio flows. Nowadays, the extent of FPI is quite large. FPI flows tend to be more difficult to calculate definitively because they compromise so many different instruments and also because of inadequate reporting. The difference between FTI and FPI can sometimes be difficult to discern given that they may overlap, especially in regard to investment in stock. It should also be noted that many host countries, even when they are in favor of capital inflows, view international debt flows, especially of the short-term variety, as bad cholesterol. In contrast, FDI is viewed as good cholesterol because it can confer the benefits. FDI is thought to be bolted down and cannot leave so easily at the first sign of trouble. Unlike short-term debt, direct investments in a country are immediately repriced in the event of a crisis. Next is different forms of FTI. Types of FTI. There are different types of foreign investment. With rapid growth and change in global investment patterns, the scope of FTI has been broadened to include the acquisition of a lasting management interest in a company or enterprise outside the investing firm's home country. As such, 
It may take many forms such as A. A direct acquisition of a foreign firm B. Construction of a facility or investment in a joint venture or strategic alliance with a local firm with attendant input of technology and C. Licensing of intellectual property Greenfield investment If foreign firms come to build an entirely new factory rather than buying an existing one in the host country Green type manufacturing FDI most desired by the host nations is only a small part of global FDI flows. This is the best kind of FDI as it creates new jobs. If Ford sets up a new factory in Chennai that is counted under greenfield investment. Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon have all set up new establishments in India. Joint Ventures JVs. JVs firm indicate when foreign and domestic firms set up a company together. The ratio of ownership, that is shareholding, varies from company to company. In some countries, there are restrictions on how much foreigners are permitted to own, say up to 49%. Such kind of ownership restrictions are generally imposed on certain sensitive sectors. Next is brownfield investment, when the foreign investor buys an existing business and grows it. This is called acquisition of a foreign firm. Vodafone bought Hutch, Groupon bought Krizel. They bought an existing business and are growing it. Such investments help get new technology and business innovation. For instance, Vodafone will train Indian managers with latest telecom ideas from the rest of the world. Some of these managers could later move to other Indian companies and pass on the best practices. According to Jeffrey P. Graham and R. Berry, Spalding over the years, the traditional concept of FDI has changed considerably. This notion of a change must be kept in the proper context. Over two-thirds of FDI is still made in the form of fixtures, machinery, equipment and buildings. Moreover, larger multinational corporations still make the overwhelming percentage of FDI. But with the advent of the internet, the increasing role of technology, loosening of direct investment restrictions in many markets and decreasing communication cost means that newer, non-traditional forms of investment will play an important role in the future. Many governments, especially in industrialized and developed nations, pay very close attention to foreign direct investment because the investment flows into and out of their economies can and does have a significant impact. As such, the expanded role of technology and intellectual property has changed the foreign direct investment playing field. Companies are still motivated to make foreign investment. But because of the vigaris of technology investments, they are now finding new vehicles to accomplish their goals. In this context, Jeffrey P. Graham and R. Berry Spalding have provided following important examples. First, licensing and technology transfer. Licensing and tech transfer have been essential in promoting collaboration between the academic and business communities. Licensing agreements allow companies to take full advantage of new and existing technologies while limiting their overall risk to royalty payments until a particular technology is fully developed and thus ready to put new products into the manufacturing pipeline. Second, reciprocal distribution agreements. Actually, this type of strategic alliance is more trade-based. But in a very real sense, it does in fact represent a type of direct investment. Basically, two companies, usually within the same or affiliated industries, agree to act as a national distributor for each other's product. The classical example is to be found in the furniture industry. A US-based manufacturer of tables signs a reciprocal distribution agreement with a Spanish-based manufacturer of chairs. Third, joint venture and other hybrid strategic alliances. Joint ventures involving three or more parties are usually called syndicates and are most often formed for specific projects such as large construction or public works projects that might involve a wide variety of expertise and resources for successful completion. In some cases, syndicates are actually easier to manage 
because the project itself sets certain limits on each party and close cooperation is not always a prerequisite for ultimate success of the endeavor. Next, rationale behind FTI. The most interesting and relevant aspect of FTI is its interlinkages, economic, institutional and legal. The importance of FTI has been increasing with steady growth in global investment and trade. In brief, FDI plays an amazing and growing role in global business. First, viewed as a way of increasing the efficiency with which the world's scarce resources are used and its perceived role in efforts to stimulate economic growth in many of the developing countries. Second, the dramatic increase in the annual global flow after 1985, stocks of FDI in turn have been growing. Third, the resulting rise in its relative importance as a source of investment funds for a number of countries, but also of new technology and intangibles such as organizational and managerial skills and marketing networks. Fourth, the process of globalization has increased importance of foreign owned production and distribution facilities in most countries. And fifth, provides a stimulus to competition, innovation, savings and capital formation and through these effects to job creation and economic growth. The rationale behind FTI can be discussed from the perspective of both investor that is home and recipient host countries. FDI has many advantages for both the investor and the recipient. Next is investor home country perspective. There are many reasons why MNCs make foreign direct investment. Investors capital may move freely to whatever business has the best prospects for growth anywhere in the world. MNCs or investors aggressively seek the best return for their money with the least risk. Such profit motive is colorblind and dominates in decision-making process of the investor. The other benefits that MNCs reap from their investment are first, access to markets, second, access to resources, third, reduces cost of production, fourth, evading foreign government requirement for local production, fifth, thwarting trade barriers hidden and otherwise, sixth, taking recourse to move from domestic export sales to a locally based national sales office. Seventh, competence to enhance output facility. Eighth, opening up of co-production, joint ventures with local partners, joint marketing arrangements, licensing, etc. FDI could be market seeking, trying to utilize opportunities in the domestic market. It could also be efficiency seeking in the sense that the MNC tries to reduce its cost of production by utilizing lower wage labor in the developing country. A third reason for FDI could be to get access to scarce resources, minerals and the like. Thus, FDI provides MNCs with new markets and marketing channels, cheaper production facilities, access to new technology, products, skills and financing. The phrase Think globally, act locally does have significant implications for MNCs. MNCs are almost always concerned with worldwide manufacturing capacity and proximity to major markets. However, the advent of the internet has ushered in a new and very different mindset that tends to focus more on excess issues. Small and medium enterprises, SMEs in particular, are now focusing on access to markets access to expertise and most of all access to technology. Next is the recipient host country perspective. Economists tend to favor FTI because it offers several advantages and it limits the ability of governments to pursue bad policies. In principle, FTI should contribute to investment and growth in host countries. In this context, following points carry favor with host country. First. A source of external capital fills investment saving gap. Second, creates further job opportunities by aiding the setting up of industrial units. Third, human resource development and brings high paying new jobs. Fourth, creates an improved physical and economic infrastructure. Fifth, fills technology gap, brings new technology, technology diffusion and knowledge transfer. Sixth, 
integration into global economy and enhances new businesses and economic development. Seventh, increased competition, trade and new markets. Eight, fills foreign exchange gap, increases exports earning and enables payment for imports. And ninth, generates increased revenue for the government. For a host country which receives the investment, it can provide a source of new technologies, capital, processes, products, organizational technologies and management skills and as such can provide a strong impetus to economic development. According to Michael R. Zincota et al., the host government is caught in a love-hate relationship with foreign direct investment. On the one hand, the host country has to appreciate the various contributions, especially economic, that the foreign direct investment will make. On the other hand, fears of dominance, interference and dependent are often voiced and acted on. Next is pattern of FTI, horizontal and vertical. According to Caves, FTI can be classified as vertical, horizontal and conglomerate. The motives for creating foreign affiliates are more complex than the stylized horizontal and vertical modes described in the literature. With increasing globalization of many industries, vertical integration rapidly taking place on a global level. Let's understand these two terms, horizontal and vertical FTI. First, horizontal FTI. Horizontal FTI is investment in the same industry abroad as a firm operates in at home. In many cases, MNCs operate HFTI activities in order to expand their operations into another market. For example, a US retailer firm that builds a store in India is trying to earn more money by exploring the Indian market. Second, HFTI acts as a substitute for exports and therefore avoiding transportation cost, import tariffs and other trade barriers. Third, Vertical FTI, VFTI. VFTI invest abroad in order to reduce the production cost. They produce intermediate products in one country and ship them for further processing to their affiliates located in other countries. VFTI replaces the labor intensive production stages like assembling and intermediate production to cheap labor countries to reduce the cost. Therefore, vertical FTI is also known as efficiency seeking FTI. The VFTI can be further subdivided into A. Backward VFTI, where an industry abroad provides inputs for a firm's domestic production process and B. Forward VFTI, in which an industry abroad sells the output of a firm's domestic production processes. In other words, VFTI occurs when an MNC decides to acquire or build an operation that either fulfills the role of a supplier, backward VFTI, or the role of a distributor, forward VFTI. Generally, MNCs that seek to go for a backward vertical FTI normally try to reduce the cost of raw materials or the supply of certain major inputs. An example of such type of backward VFTI may be in the case of car manufacturing. In manufacturing of cars, steel is a major material. And if the car manufacturer acquires the foreign steel supplier, it will no longer need to deal separately with the steel supplier and face the consequences of fluctuations in steel prices. Similarly, the need for a forward VFTI arises from the problem of getting new distributors for a specific market. For example, suppose the same US car manufacturer wants to sell its car in Indian auto market. Since many Indian auto dealers do not wish to sell US brand cars resulting in US car manufacturer facing a very tough task of finding a distributor. Given the situation, the US manufacturer of cars will build its own distribution network in India to fulfill its objective of distributing cars in India. According to Selma Kurtisi Kastrati, VFTI involves a geographical decentralization of the firm's production chain, where foreign affiliates in poorer countries typically produce labor-intensive intermediates that are shipped back to high-wage countries often to the parent company itself. VFTI is sometimes referred to as efficiency-seeking FTI, 
since the main motive for the investment is to improve the cost of effectiveness of the firm's production. Historically, most backward VFTI has been in extractive industries, for example, oil extraction. Whereas in forward VFTI, an industry abroad sells the output of a firm's domestic production process. In this context, Lawrence Chow V. Chung has observed that knowledge intensive activities will be located in a country where skilled labor is cheap, while production takes place where unskilled labor is cheap. The firm level scale economies stimulate horizontal investments that have the same production process in different countries. Skill differences favor vertical investments when the parent company is skilled labor abundant. Host country trade cost have a positive effect in the horizontal model. Natalia Ramondo et al. have pointed out that knowledge capital, technology, capital and managerial ability are intangibles. The comparative advantage of MNCs lies in their ability to transfer intangible rather than physical inputs among production units. Sharing these intangibles can be an advantage in the production of input-output linked goods, even in the absence of physical shipments between affiliates. However, horizontal FTI as opposed to vertical FTI captured the role of the majority of the MNCs. Marcusen and Marcus note that the choice between vertical and horizontal production structures depends on country characteristics such as relative size and relative endowment differences, as well as trade and investment cost. Azim Mana and Marion have observed that HFTI and VFTI production strategies can have very different implications for the distribution of income both within and across countries. VFTI may compress the skilled, non-skilled wage differential across countries as well as change the income distribution within countries. HFTI may increase income in each country with minor distributive impact. Next is impact and implications of FDI in recipient countries. Recently, a new form of foreign investment has come up and that is of MNC setting up research centers abroad. In India, IBM, Microsoft, GE, Sony Ericsson and many other MNCs have set up research centers. This also utilizes a form of cheaper labor Indian professionals and scientists could be paid less than their counterparts in the developed centuries. Research requires not just individual scientists but whole group of such scientists. India is by now well known for the substantial supply of well qualified scientists and technicians. MNC's research centers in India set up to tap into this supply are responsible for a lot of the patents that have been acquired out of India in the IT sector. The growing strength of India is in knowledge based sectors such as software and R&D and this is manifested in growing foreign investment in these sectors. The investment of foreign capital in setting up research centers in India and China is an important new trend in MNC's operations in developing economies. Non-investment foreign control production. Foreign influences over host country economic activities can well occur without any capital investment at all. This occurs in a country in a number of new forms of relationship. A. Contracted manufacturing and farming. B. Outsourcing of services. And C. Franchising or licensing. All these are becoming very common form of global production in which contracted production within global production networks, GPNs or global value chains, GVCs take place. In this context, the point to note is that there are forms of foreign control over production that do not involve foreign capital investment. The growth of contracted production provides access to foreign buyers to control without capital investment is a new phenomena and it has many implications that need careful consideration. Next is impact of FTI. Although the importance of FTI as a source of capital and output generation has increased since 1990s. Its impact on direct investment and growth is mixed as some FTI inflows possibly crowd in domestic investments while some others crowd it out. 
one way to maximize the contribution of FDI to host countries' development is to improve changes of FDI, crowding in domestic investments and minimize the possibilities of it crowding out domestic investment. Export-oriented FDI minimize the possibilities of crowding out of domestic investment and generates favorable spillovers for domestic investment by creating demand for intermediate goods. Investment policy that can help in maximizing the contribution of FDI inflows is to push them to newer areas where local capabilities do not exist, as that minimizes the chances of conflict with domestic investment. Policy may also foster diffusion of knowledge brought in by foreign enterprises by promoting vertical inter-firm linkages with domestic enterprises through various means such as local content regulations or by creating sub-national or sub-regional clusters that facilitate the spillovers of knowledge through informal and social contracts among the employees besides traditional buyer-seller links. However, it is of critical importance for the host governments to preserve policy flexibility to pursue selective policy in regard to FDI. It is important to note that advantages and disadvantages of FDI are often a matter of perspective. FDI is very risky since the political issues in several countries can instantly change. Opponents of FTI are of the view that multinational companies are able to wield greater power over smaller and weaker economies and can drive out much local competition. It is important to remember that too much foreign ownership of companies can be a concern, especially in industries that are strategically important. Or they can borrow against the company's collateral locally and lend the funds back to the parent company. Although there are always downsides to economic policies, the lens that many countries go to attract foreign direct investment suggests that the picture overall remains positive. The benefits of FTI far drop the drawbacks. A new development of reverse investment, joint ventures, wholly owned subsidiaries abroad by Indian MNCs is an important development. Such investment by Indian firm abroad has been in the form of acquisition of companies, acquiring particular technology capabilities and securing access to raw materials. Now, let us summarize. Investment from one country into another normally by MNCs rather than governments that involves establishing operations or acquiring tangible assets, including stakes in other businesses. The investor's purpose being to have an effective voice in the management of the enterprise. The lasting interest, effective control of a foreign investor is indicated by either it owns 10% or more of the ordinary shares or voting power in an enterprise to be able to maintain an effective voice in management. FDI is distinguished from FPI by the element of control. The components of FDI are equity capital, reinvested earnings and other capital, mainly intra-company loans. FDI plays a significant role in global economic development. FDI flows generally come as capital, bundled with technology, skill and sometimes even market access. The rationale behind foreign capital is that it contributes to the growth of a developing economy by reducing three types of gap, that is saving gap, foreign exchange gap and technology gap. Renewed interest in FDI has been stimulated by the perception that trade and FDI are simply two ways, but increasingly complementary of servicing foreign markets and that they are already interlinked in a variety of ways. The source of foreign capital can be public or private. The public capital comes from foreign governments, multilateral organizations like the World Bank, ADB, etc. Private foreign capital is of two types, FTI and FPI. The three major trading and investment blocks in the international arena are the US, the EU and Japan. Foreign capital has grown substantially with opening up of the economy. However, the total foreign investments have become volatile due to FPI. Vertical FTI takes place when the multinational fragments the production process internationally locating each stage of production in the country where it can be done at the least cost. 
horizontal investments replicate the complete production process of the home country in a foreign country. It occurs when the multinational undertakes the same production activities in multiple countries. Several new forms of investment in the shape of setting up of research centers by MNCs, securing excess of raw materials, etc. have emerged. The advantages of foreign direct investment come from a long-term relationship between two countries in the form of overall economic growth, development of human capital resources, creation of new jobs, increase in income, etc. Governments have been criticized for making their policies suit foreign direct investors more than they suit the needs of domestic investors and the public. Achieving a consensus of FDI as having a mainly positive impact in developing economies is more likely if MNCs place greater emphasis on social welfare, resource protection and pollution control from the outset. Thank you.